There are several hats that I wear. There's, there's one other that uh, will, um, might be of interest. I'm involved in, a, in an organization on the board called A Godly Response to Abuse Within the Christian Environment. Mm -hmm. And it's an organization that seeks to um, both educate on the one hand and then investigate at the request of Christian uh, churches and agencies and institutions uh, mishandling of child sexual abuse uh, in, in the wider church. Uh, we did a major report on um, uh, New Tribe missions at their request. They had, uh, uh, they had boarding schools all around the world for their missionary children, and they had a hive in Senegal, Africa, just heartbreaking uh, uh, wickedness that went on there, and a whole generation of, of youngsters that were missionary children that were damaged. We're currently wrapping up uh, uh, a two-year investigation of Bob Jones University at the request of their board and are um, soon to issue a report. So covet your prayers about that, that all would be able to have ears and hear and that good would come out of difficulty. Uh, my, uh, my happier hat to wear, though, is uh, as the associate pastor at Christ Church in Katy, Texas, growing suburb on the western edge of Houston. Our, our senior pastor is Fred Greco. He's the chairman of the PCA Standing Judicial Commission. So if you ever end up in a lot of trouble, you'll stand in front of him one day. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's uh, my joy to, to bring greetings from our pastoral staff and also from, from the session of the church. We, we find ourselves in a booming, growing area. I get out of the car each morning to the sound of hammers, uh, and they're putting on, uh, putting on roofs. They, in Houston, they, they plant neighborhoods at the same frequency in my, my hometown in South Carolina. They build houses. There are thousands and thousands of houses growing up or going up within easy walking distance of the church. It's just amazing. And so we have people walk in our, our doors from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. And uh, so it's been, a, uh, it's been a very humbling experience to be sort of, uh, sort of in the delivery room as a midwife where, where we have people coming to faith, we have people moving in, uh, we do an uh, English as a second language program and that draws people from the community. We, we do the old fashioned vacation Bible school in order to try to provide a service and raise awareness in the community, but uh, the main thing that we do is uh, biblical expository, expository serial preaching. Uh, we read the word and preach the word and sing the word and pray the word and see it in the sacraments uh, with the ordinary means of grace ministry as is done in this church. So I uh, commend to you uh, uh, or give you commendation and appreciation from our, from our church back in Katy. It, uh, it was a, a, a pleasure to be asked by Chris to come and, in the session to come and speak. My, uh, my background is in the sciences, but uh, my own PhD work at the University of Edinburgh, New College, uh, was in the area of Christology. I, I studied uh, a Scottish theologian who, who died about, uh, oh, I guess about 10 years ago, uh, Professor T.F. Torrance, um, who was the foremost purveyor of Bardian, of Bart's theology to the English-speaking world. And I studied his understanding of the humanity of Christ. And so what I want to do with you this morning is, in light of our wider cultural situation that we're now facing, have a look once again at the, the, the classic historic Christian doctrine of the person of Christ, that as we uh, live in this world with growing diversity and ease of transportation and communication, and it's not just that we go to every time and tribe and people and nation, but they come to us and they... They come sometimes and sit next to us in the cafeteria, in our classroom, or even on the pew next to us. It's good for us to sharpen our pencil once again and remember who our Lord is and what he's done in his incarnation uh, for us. Uh, part of the jumping off point for this is our postmodern um, and internationalizing context. And, and boy, the world has changed, hasn't it? We recently had an election. We, you take a, a deep breath and you think back 10 or 15 or 20 years ago as to what the world was like, and it seems like you get whiplash. I don't just think that's my age. I think, uh, I think that's true generally for the culture. I remember the day I was standing at Reform Seminary uh, in, a, in, a, in a faculty um, uh, secretarial area, and, and I was getting my mail, and there was a, there was a box, you know, that had come from uh, uh, a publisher, and I ripped open the cord, and and pulled out Robert Goss's Jesus Acted Up, a Gay and Lesbian Manifesto. And my colleague, who was uh, Dr. Ligon Duncan, who's now uh, the Chancellor of Reform Seminary, um, he had an immediate and visceral reaction. He said, 
Ooh, he said, don't tell me you paid money for that. <laughs> it's, a, um, uh, it's a Harper Collins San Francisco publication. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I did. I said, uh, you need to know your enemy. You need to know what the opposition is up to. And uh, Robert Goss, in his volume, uh, laid out the first uh, heavy argument uh, in a readily accessible mainline publisher uh, arguing that Jesus is the archetype gay male, that he is one who uh, uh, gives us uh, the lead on how we ought to relate uh, to the uh, homosexual community, uh, that, uh, that his pattern um, of handling power and of handling relationships should reconstruct our understanding, not only of the church, but also of him personally. And... Uh, uh, it's in the face of such ideas uh, in this brave new world that we're facing, this brave new world order, uh, given the speed at which uh, the uh, homosexual lobby has gained uh, not just a voice, but uh, a degree of leverage uh, within the political community uh, and in the religious community, that we do well to stop and take a breath and remind ourselves uh, just who this Jesus is that we're talking about. What, what is the cure? What is the Christian remedy uh, for changes in our context and, and challenges uh, with regard to Christian doctrine? Well, it's uh, not to panic. It's to keep calm and to go back to the Bible. Uh, Christian history, if it teaches us anything, shows us a long series of challenges uh, that have come from uh, the very first days after our Lord's ascension. Uh, to uh, historic, orthodox, proper Christian doctrine. Um, challenges that have come in the providence of God. We serve a sovereign Lord. Nothing happens that He Himself is not sovereign over, that the divine decree has not included, and that He does not use and work uh, for good and blessing ultimately in the life of His church and in His world. And so, as these challenges have come, being allowed in the providence of God, they have come in order to force his church to go back to the scriptures, to go back to the word of God with the question, is it true? Is it really true that the God of the Old Testament is one God and the God of the New Testament is another? And the church was driven back to the, to the very word of God and, and saw there that already God had given light in his word and the answer was no. It's the same God. It's the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Old Testament knew. Or those who claim that, that uh, Jesus himself uh, had no human nature, uh, that he really only appeared to have a human nature. Is that really the Savior that we love and worship? One who's not really human at all? And so the, the church was driven back to the Word to examine it. And there, the Word is very plain that if we... If we do not accept that Jesus is coming to the flesh, come in the flesh, then, then we ourselves are of the spirit of Antichrist. This has happened down through the ages in, in, the, uh, in the period of the Middle Ages, questions about whether men had in their own nature the strength, uh, to put it in American terms, to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, and to uh, obey God in a way that uh, meant they had the capacity to love Him uh, in and of uh, their native fallen selves and driven back to the word the answer was no or whether the the sacraments the bread as bread and the or it's as substance and the cup as substance itself whatever that substance may be is that the the physical means through which we are saved that in partaking of these things uh, grace is infused in us and and we therefore are able to obey god and we we gain a right standing with him because of this uh uh, power, drink, induced goodness that we live out and driven back to the word of God the answer was no. And so in the face of proposals like Goss we, we should see this is a frankly exciting opportunity. An occasion on which we come expectantly to the scriptures for the Lord to help us see more of what has always been there. That light would break forth and that we would come to understand perhaps more clearly than ever before, the importance of the biblical doctrine of the Incarnation, uh, which is the foundation to also his great work of the atonement. Well, uh, 
as we study this topic together, um, we have to remember what uh, the study of Christ is in broad brush. We study this person and we look at his divinity and his humanity as well as the unity of the two. He is the God-man. He is divine and he is human. And somehow these two natures uh, fit together. And somehow there is unity in his person. And having challenges about who he was and what he was like forces us to re-examine uh, those basic truths. Uh, to round out the rest of Christology, there is the work of Christ. We, we study him as prophet, priest, and king. Uh, his threefold ministry is mediator. And uh, he is the one who brings uh, the content foreshadowed in all three of those Old Testament offices together in one person. And uh, he is our only hope of salvation. Uh, indeed, the man Jesus Christ. His work in each one of those capacities. Both in humiliation and in exaltation. Both during his time on earth, uh, from the time of his virginal conception until the time of his ascension. But also, uh, after his ascension, uh, even now, from the very throne of God, he still continues to work as our prophet, priest, and king. And how do we know of him? Well, the scripture is normative. Uh, the Bible is the, is the very word of God. Uh, the apostle Paul speaks to us of it being God-breathed in his pastoral epistles. The apostle Peter speaks to us of the authors having been, uh, the prophets of old having been picked up and carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that what they say, yes, is their words, but in the most primary and fundamental sense, these words are God's words. Uh, what the, there, there's an interesting aspect of the grammar that, that the fisherman Peter uses, which is that, that God is the one, the Holy Spirit is the one who carries along the authors, and they are grammatically indicated as being passive, whereas God is the major active one. Now, everyone knows that, that Peter and Paul and Moses spoke and wrote, and so there's no doubt that, that there was human activity, human authors engaged in writing and speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But yet God's role in giving them every word, in breathing His word out through them, in having shaped and molded and fashioned their history and their personalities, and their utterance under inspiration, their writing under inspiration, just at that point, to produce a text which is inspired. A text which is God-breathed. Uh, that fundamental role of the Holy Spirit is not to be forgotten. And so in the Old Testament, before Jesus comes and we see Him face to face, we have shadow. Where God speaks, He prepares the ground, He helps us understand uh, the basic categories through which we will be able to more fully grasp who Jesus is and what He has done for us. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist announces, but... If you didn't know what a lamb was, if you didn't know a lamb's role in the whole sacrificial mosaic system, if, if you didn't understand the concept of sacrifice, the concept of substitution, the concept of reconciliation, then, then the baptizer's words in the New Testament would mean less to you. And you would still be groping to understand who is this Jesus. So the Old Testament provides all the background. It, it cuts down, chops down the trees. It, it uh, fashions them into logs from which to, to construct the log cabin in the new. And so its foreshadowing work is not uh, any insult to it. It's, uh, it's place in the whole scheme of the development of our understanding of Christian doctrine and of salvation. In the New Testament, we see the reality face to face. And so we know that He is the one who is the Lamb of God, and He is also the shepherd of the sheep, of His people. And, and so these Old Testament themes are something that we can begin synthesizing together. My uh, daughter and I spent uh, most of yesterday walking around the engineering college uh, here at VT. It was, it was a lot of fun to do so. And uh, you, you end up listening to different uh, spiels about what people are doing, research that they're engaged in, uh, what the hopes are for practical application of their discoveries. And in engineering, you take real life practical situations and, and you do that most amazing thing. You apply mathematics to them. Uh, you apply chemistry to them. You apply uh, physics and, and mechanics and, and out of this uh, uh, great uh, boiling cauldron of knowledge, 
uh, you, you dig out some great new insight and, and application. Well, in the same way, in the New Testament, all of the different themes and strands and teachings of the Old, as well as the newly declared special revelation in the appearance of our Lord and every word that He said and every deed which He did, uh, those all come together. And, and we begin, under the tutelage of the apostles, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to, to begin crawling. And we begin doing that work of synthesizing, of seeing how God's true truth Every word he spoke to us, how one thing interrelates with another, how these interconnected uh, different bits all come together to form a greater whole, that we might understand not just the mind of the human author carried along, but also the divine mind behind them and carrying them along, the fuller and wider uh, meaning. And so we begin to appreciate the doctrine of the Trinity, which was latent in the Old Testament, but becomes patent in the New in the face and teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we understand from the Old Testament uh, themes and ideas which point in the direction of resurrection. And in the New, we see the resurrection light and the truth begins to dawn on us as more and more is said about what that means not just for Jesus, but what it means for you and me. That uh, indeed, like Job, we shall see him in the flesh. We shall see our maker. We shall know him. He shall come again as power, in power, as Daniel says. And so all of this synthesis of things, seen, uh, of things takes place in the New Testament. But we do not stand alone interpreting the Bible. You know, there are some Protestant traditions that say, me and my Bible and absolutely nothing more. I have a dear friend who ended up sitting next to a... Uh, uh, a well-known, uh, well, I, I'd even say, Christian um, uh, uh, leader and uh, on a plane. And uh, during their conversation, the Christian leader bragged to him uh, that they had never read, in the last 25 years, they had never read any other book other than the Bible. And the Christian leader thought this was a great bragging point and expected my friend to uh, pat them on the back and say, oh, you're a really holy person. But his response was proper. He said, that's sad. Because lying behind that is the quiet assumption of self-sufficiency and arrogance. We, we are but uh, does. We are but fallen men and women and boys and girls who who need not only the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, but we need also the, the indirect means of grace and the fellowship and communion of the saints. We, if we have any synthesis and any thought and any doctrine that we found right in the Bible, it's not a private possession for us to keep to ourselves. We must tell one another. And so we stand on the shoulders of greats that have come before. Let me ask you, who is your favorite theologian of all times? Now, if, if someone here did not say Chris Hutchinson, I would be most uh, upset with this. <laughs> and if the next one that you listed was not John Calvin or John Knox or, you know, at least somebody with a Scottish accent, or, uh, I would be disappointed. But, but who, who do you read? Who do you value? Who do you consciously stand on the shoulders of? But now think. Think about the others that you have not yet read. See how much more you have to look forward to. Because the Reformed Church, the, the PCA, the, the Reformed Church more broadly, is not merely based upon John Knox and John Calvin. We have much debt that we owe uh, to the medieval scholastics, to the early church fathers. If you haven't read Irenaeus and his proof of apostolic preaching, you have a treat waiting for you to encourage your soul. If you haven't read Cur Deus Homo by Anselm, there's something still there for you to read and get your teeth into. Athanasius on the Atonement. There are plenty of historic Christian works, yes, that are just like our own. Uh, they may contain uh, two or three cups worth of valuable biblical insight and teaching, and then there always is a little dross, isn't there? Some blind spots, some silliness. We, we are not blocks of cheddar cheese. We are always Swiss. 
There's always a hole in there somewhere. That when we slice it, it sort of makes the sandwich look a little funny before you close it. We do well to remember that we have a debt to the early church. You know, there is a, a great symmetry today between what we're experiencing in, in 21st century America and what went on in the generations before. No longer do we live in the leave it to be the world. Uh, the Christian church is not a quietly assumed foundation of our society. Do you know in New York they're allowing uh, insects now openly? Um, documented and approbated by the state in Germany. They have just recently uh, had the legal rec recommendation that incest between direct siblings should be allowed. And the question of genetic defect and damage to the next generation and suffering has been swept away in the recommendations with the simple statement, well, yeah, we can test for that on the board. What's driving this? Well, it's a, an interesting confluence of, of other pillars, ethical, moral, of society that have been knocked out. If you're going to allow homosexual marriage, if, if you're going to allow abortion, then that opens up the brave new world of incest. And all of the chaos and heartache and confusion and oppression that will occur even now in the cradle and in the home in which children are raised if this becomes the flourishing Western way. Uh, God help us. There was a time in which there was such chaos, infanticide, and uh, raving predatory sexual activity. And it was during the time of the early church, during the time of the Roman Empire, as she festered and fell apart over and over again. The church has faced these problems before. And so we do well to remember and listen and read even the early church fathers because they faced a context that is hauntingly similar to our own. However, we do face one difference. You know, uh, life is a parabola. When you're young, you're dependent on your parents. And as you grow older, you're looking after your own children until you reach that time when you're caring for your parents. My, my father recently died. He had bile duct cancer. It was suddenly diagnosed with a short period of time to live. We, we brought him from South Carolina to uh, our home in Houston, he and my mother, and, and uh, MD Anderson. Uh, they worked very hard and they got the cancer out, but he was so weakened he couldn't survive the recovery from the, from the surgery. And my mother's blind. She has retinitis pigmentosa, and so she's now living in our home. And, and one morning over breakfast, uh, I fixed breakfast at 5.30, and my mother comes and joins me and has a cup of coffee as I fix the breakfast, and we get to chat. And uh, one morning, she shocked me. Um, she said, well, uh, I want to get you a gift uh, for Father's Day. I said, you're not my father. I'm not your father. And she said, oh, no, yes, you are. You have a new child here. I'm in your home now, and I want to get you a gift. Well, you know, it's, it's that parabola of life that she was describing. She was wiser than I was. I had never given it a thought. As we get older, sometimes we, we begin to take on a role that, that only in our life did we have at an earlier age. Well, the difference is, of course, when you're going up the parabola, it's one kind of thing. When you're going down the parabola, it's another. And, and so, too, in our society, yes, the early church went through a cultural context hauntingly similar like our own, but to be in a post-Christian era rather than a growth emerging Christian era is a completely different context in which to live. And so we have to be careful how we appropriate uh, those lessons. I mentioned the medieval church. We, we think of the adoration of the elements. We think of the, um, the worship of bread and the darkest and most confused aspects of, of that whole period. But yet there still are things to learn there. There still are things about the Trinity. There still are things about even the person of Christ that we do well to listen to our medieval uh, brothers in the faith that have come before. The Reformation Church, that's our favorite era. Uh, we love to listen to Calvin, Luther, Bootser, Zwingli, um, if you haven't spent any time with Aqualempadius yet, you have a delight waiting for you. 
Uh, the first and second generation reformers are, are dear friends, and there's much there, especially about classic Christology, to mine and to enjoy. If you don't have time to read all of them, I commend a volume to you. Uh, it's by a, uh, by a German uh, historian. His name is Heinrich Heppe, H-E-P-P-E. -E. Wrote a book entitled Reform Dogmatics. Uh, in, in, the, in an age before the Xerox machine, he went into the major libraries of Europe and laid out 100 of the finest uh, uh, treatments of theology that had been written by the Protestant Orthodox scholastics. He laid them all out, turned them all not to the same page number, but to the same topic. And he went and read all of them and then copied down in Latin um, the best quotes from each of them on uh, the full range of topics in uh, the Christian faith, in Christian doctrine. And then he uh, glued them together with a little German text. And at the beginning of the 20th century, our, our Scottish friends over in Edinburgh translated the whole mess into English so we can read it. And uh, that one volume, I guess it's about 600 pages, will save you from having to read uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of pages of, uh, of uh, Latin and volumes. And you can get uh, the Reformation and post-Reformation era uh, doctrinal perspective. But even the modern church has something to teach us. Oftentimes, by contrast, we'll say more about that later. Scripture is normative, and so we have to remember that inspiration is verbal, according to 2 Timothy 3.16. Inspiration is full, John 10.35. Uh, there's not, uh, the scripture cannot be broken. There's not a jot or tittle of it, uh, which has not come from our Lord. Uh, it is organic. Inspiration is something that involves the human under the influence of God, and uh, therefore we can trace the lines of the activity of God on the one hand and man under his influence on the other. Both sets of authors, God working uh, from the divine to the human, and we work in our thinking as we seek to understand from the human back toward the divine. You know, our Mormon friends, they readily will give us copies of the Book of Mormon. They usually don't give us uh, Doctrines and Covenants of the Pearl of Great Cross, but they, but they give us uh, the Book of Mormon and, and they tell us to read it, but we're not to study it. What we're supposed to do is go out on a lonely hillside and pray for direct revelation as to whether it's true or not. And of course, that's not the way God approbates his word to us. God has given us by inspiration his holy word, the Bible, and as we read and engage, we work from the human back toward the divine. That is, we seek to understand what the text says. What does Paul mean here? What is Moses trying to say? This is a wonderful psalm by David. Now, how does this relate to what Elijah taught? And as we compare one part of scripture with another, we begin to see the wider divine teaching. We do not have access to the divine teaching in abstraction from uh, the writing and the words themselves, which have been given under inspiration. Oh, we work from the human to the divine and come to a wider and deeper appreciation. Revelation is progressive so that we might be able to do that. The New Testament interprets the Old, and so that gives us the pattern for understanding all of the Bible. This Old Testament uh, background, we could spend time tracing Theophanies of old in Genesis 3, Adam walking with God. Genesis 16, even Hagar uh, saw the Lord and walked with him. Uh, Jacob wrestled with him and suffered bodily injury, so we know that it was not just a dream or a figment of his imagination. God was really there, manifest in some pre-incarnate manifestation of the second person of the Trinity. All Israel saw this angel of the Lord, uh, so-called, who then is called God. And in Judges 6, Gideon visited with him. Judges 13, Samson was announced by him. There also is indication of his coming, of Jesus' coming in the flesh in the Psalms. Uh, Hebrews 1.5 interprets Hebrews 2.7. Matthew 27 interprets Psalm 22. That is, Jesus himself on the cross saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that Psalm 22, which is not as well known in the church as it ought to be as far as uh, popularity in the pew goes. We, we all love Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
and to the tune Crimin, it is absolutely delightful. But Psalm 22, the one before, begins with the words that Jesus took upon his own lips on the cross, and it proceeds with a description of his crucifixion, and then in the middle of the psalm turns and focuses on the glories of the resurrection to come. Oh, the life of Christ is given there in the Psalms. Psalm 45, Psalm 68, these different Psalms are interpreted in the New Testament as having always given, always having been intended to give a Christological teaching. Uh, there's a wonderful little article by the Princetonian B.B. Warfield entitled The Emotional Life of Our Lord. And he surveys the synoptic gospels for evidence of Jesus having true human emotions. And it's a, it's a wonderful line through which to argue for uh, the true humanity of our, of, our, of our Lord. But you know, someone needs to go through and do it with the Old Testament gospel. You see, the Psalms are not just a, a book of poetry about anything at all really them. The Psalms are messianic in their force and direction. And they disclose to us so much of the inner life of our Lord. If you want to know how to navigate the seas of your own personal, emotional, thought and behavioral life as a Christian, you need to read the Psalms and see and hear there and feel there even as you sing them what your Savior was like and therefore what Christ's likeness looks like on the inside, there you will find that it is okay to be downright angry at the evil things happening in the world. It is actually okay to go to your Heavenly Father in despair, praying that He would give life and strength, begging Him to deal with those things that threaten in this life. You will learn how to live the Christian life and uh, keep your sanity at the same time as you read and study and pray. The Psalms, they teach of Him. Uh, the prophets pointed to our Lord. John interprets Isaiah. Uh, the words of Jesus Himself reading from Isaiah 6 and taking them uh, upon Himself. The same is true of Isaiah 7. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 62. It is from the words of the prophets that we come to understand, interpreted properly for us in the New Testament, of the importance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is to come. Micah and Zechariah, even the minor prophets, uh, having uh, information pre-embedded, pre-loaded in them, that in the light of uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the coming of Jesus, the apostles, would rightly see as having pointed to him. Oh, the, the Old Testament prepares for his coming, and so we do well to appreciate all of it. But if we're going to assert the deity of Jesus, first of all, we have to come to grips with how in the world could we ever know he's divine? You know, we oftentimes just want to turn into the Bible and find that chapter on systematic theology that says, Christology, person of Christ, deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we want that verse that says, Jesus is the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Now, now your search through a Bible concordance or even through uh, your iPhone app on uh, ESV study Bible, you will not find which word of that statement anywhere in the scriptures. Trinity. Trinity is a theological term, not a biblical term. You have to ask the question not, does the Bible use the theological tag word for this? No, you have to go one level deeper. Does the Bible teach this substance, this content, that we label with the theological term Trinity? In the same way, when you're dealing with the incarnation of the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, that, that He is God and that He takes on flesh and dwells among us, you can't just look for um, whole sentences like whole bolts of cloth from which the doctrine of the Trinity is made. No, it's, it's woven together. It's synthesized from various strands of teaching in the Scriptures. That doesn't make it any less true. It makes it 
More true, as it were. It means that there's not one verse or one chapter, but it's literally evidence on every page that is woven together in the providence of God for us to understand these basic fundamental Christian doctrines. How do you know? Well, we know that it's a duck because it looks like one, it walks like one, and it quacks like one, and therefore it's a duck. Or if I, uh, if I flip the lens in this um, exercise of optometry, and I say, uh, how do you know that Elvis, Elvis Presley is the king of rock and roll? Do you look in the Bible for evidence that says Elvis is king? Do you know... Uh, the word Elvis means a number of different things. They, uh, um, they restocked the hills of Kentucky with elk some years ago. And uh, one fairly large specimen managed to wander his way down to uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, onto the uh, reservation there uh, where the National Lab is located. Uh, the animal was uh, some 700 pounds, apparently. Just a giant, and he kept uh, on the oddest occasions being seen, and so he was dubbed Elvis. <laughs> I think as the story goes, uh, Elvis wandered in the road one day and was hit by a uh, large truck, and uh, both Elvis and the truck suffered greatly from that collision. So who is Elvis? How, how do we know that Elvis is the king of rock and roll? Well, yes, it might be his good boyish looks. I, I think there's a pointer on here somewhere. There we go. It's his good boyish looks, it's the sound of his voice, it's the way he's able to perform or dance or all the adoration that he receives, or maybe it's just all the gold records that he has. There's evidence along multiple lines that would lead us to draw the conclusion that Elvis is the king of rock and roll. And each line of evidence is important in synthesizing that argument. So how is Jesus really divine? Well... We know that he's really divine because of multiple strands of argument and layers of evidence. He receives in the Bible divine titles. He also is said to have divine attributes. In addition to that, he performs divine works, works that only God can do. And then finally, he receives divine prerogatives. And so it's not just one verse or one chapter it's not an appendix to the Bible called a systematic theology text. The strands and evidence there permeate the New Testament and even go back into the Old. And so the stability of this doctrine is, is greater. And the way in which God has communicated it to us is much to be admired because it leaves us in a more comfortable and assured and strong position than if he had just given us one verse or one page with a definitive statement that would settle it for us because it wouldn't be long until we drew it into that. So let's look at divine titles. The first one is one we're happy to see, which is the title God or Theos. And the Bible contains a whole set of different um, uses of this term that are used in reference to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word. As we continue on in the chapter, we can see that the Word is none other than Jesus Himself. And we are told that the Word was both with God and was God. Several weeks ago, my uh, freshman college student, uh, middle son, who's uh, at Texas A&M studying late antiquity, is taking uh, classical Greek and Latin. He called me with great enthusiasm and said, Dad, there was a reference today in my, in my Greek class, my classical Greek class, on uh, the topic of uh, um, uh, basic fundamental grammar. There was a reference to the Bible and to Christian theology that was made today by my professor. I, I don't think the professor's a Christian, but, but he was making a very important uh, a point that, that the presence or absence of a definite article in Greek can be there for a number of different reasons and we need to be careful with how we handle it. And he pointed to the misuse and misinterpretation of John 1.1 1, 1 by our Jehovah's Witness friends that knock on our door. They tried to assert that Jesus was a God rather than the God. That he was just uh, a lower level of creation, a God with a little g. Um, 
that he was not truly the one eternal God, who is Jehovah, rather he is just a uh, creation of Jehovah. And they do so because of a misinterpretation of this verse. The word was not a God, the word was God. Uh, there are several lines of grammatical reading, why the uh, grammatical evidence as to why this particular construction is chosen by John in order to avoid both polytheism on the one hand uh, and uh, simple identification on the other. He's, he's treading a line, using a line of grammar that allows for the doctrine of the Trinity and avoids the two heretical options of collapsing into Unitarianism or uh, exploding in, into tritheism. Uh, the Bible also, uh, 17 verses later, says that Jesus is the only begotten God. And so the term theos, or God, is used there with regard to him again. What does Thomas say in John 20? My Lord and my God. And we don't have Jesus say, now stop you right there, Thomas. You're barking up a wrong tree, Thomas. You're saying something very heretical, Thomas. I'm not God. No, Jesus receives that title. The resurrected Lord receives that title. And uh, commendation is spoken to the rest of us for believing such, uh, even without having to see him. In the book of Hebrews, these Old Testament, especially psalm passages that I referenced earlier, all of them make reference to God. And so over and over and over again, the Old Testament use of the term translated in the Septuagint, like theos, or God, in Greek, uh, is referred to Jesus by the author of Hebrews. In Titus 2, you have an interesting little grammatical structure called the, um, what's classically called the Granville Sharp Rule. It's, it's an implied appositive where you have the words Jesus Christ used in the sentence, and then you have the, uh, uh, the little connecting uh, uh, word or particle there, and. And the question is, is Jesus Christ just Savior? Or is the force of and so great it pulls uh, this uh, uh, a positive of Jesus back to also apply to great God? When a, when a speaker uses chi or and in Greek, does it apply? Does something uh, apply just to what's on one side of the and or on both sides? And, and it's an established rule of Greek grammar that, that the force of chi is so great as to pull it back to both. Paul is saying in Titus 2.13 that Jesus Christ is Savior and that Jesus Christ is God. The term theos grammatically is there being used to refer to Jesus. In 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, uh, you have the same phenomenon used by Peter where Jesus Christ is being used to refer to both Savior and uh, to God. But that's not the only divine title. There's also the divine title, Lord. And so we have a, a whole catalog of the use of Lord in the New Testament, particularly used by the Apostle Paul. Romans 1.4, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Curious, this, this word being identified with deity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.2, in the name of our Lord Jesus, or our Lord Jesus Christ, referring to his Messiah as well. In uh, 1 Corinthians 16.22, a very interesting term which pops up that is a transliteration into Greek of an Aramaic term, Maranatha, O Lord, come. There, the first portion of the word mar being the term for Lord in this exclamatory statement. So the Apostle Paul one of the Pharisaical parties saved by the Lord on the road to Damascus, speaking to a Greek Christian church, not only using the Greek language to speak to them, but in Corinth, in Greece herself. Paul, speaking to an audience, to a synagogue, to a new Christian church, which includes both uh, diaspora Jews and a large number of God-fearers, who have attached themselves uh, first to the Jewish synagogue and then to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he uses here a term from Palestine referring to deity and makes reference to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's not just the Jews in the room that get it. It's also something that is appreciated widely in the church 
In other words, the use of this title, Lord, is one that in the text transcends the Greek language and uh, is something that uh, removes from the table the possibility that this is just a Jewish or just a Jewish idea or just a Greek idea, not a Jewish idea. No, it's one that includes both. James 1.1, 1, 1, one of the oldest books in the Bible, our uh, uh, earliest books in the New Testament, James 1.1, 1, 1, the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses it a second time in his book. And we can also read Philippians 2.9 to 11 in light of Isaiah 45.22 and following, and we see there that the parallel in thought and language is such that the Apostle Paul is alluding back to the earlier passage. This is in the great hymn to Christ, which begins, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name Jesus every knee should bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The Old Testament passage speaks of this bowing down and this confessing, and the New Testament passage links that to the term Lord and specifically to Jesus Christ. He also is given the title Son of God. And we see that in Romans 1 and in Colossians 1 uh, a number of times. In Matthew 11, 27, no one knows the Father but the Son. Jesus takes that language of being the Son of the Father, the Son of God, upon his own lips. He does this over and over again. I and the Father are one in John. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And uh, he is reasoned by John to have called God Father and therefore made himself equal with God. And, and the algorithm that allows that connection is indeed this title, Son of God. But the title Son of Man is also a divine title. Now, we have to admit on the face of it that Son of God says Theos, so God, that implies deity. And Son of Man uses the term anthropos. It, it uses language which speaks of humanity in and of itself. But when you take that word man and you add son of to it and you put it within its canonical wider context, especially uh, the book of Daniel, there you begin to see that it's used as a title in the word son of man uh, to indicate deity. Daniel 7 says, And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was come. And it was Jesus' self-designation. He gives Son of Man sayings. And uh, these deal with his earthly life, and with his passion, and with his second coming. This is a title Jesus enjoyed taking upon his own lips. It spoke of his future of coming in power. And during a time of humiliation, you can understand the encouragement that would be to him. But it also is the one title that ironically has overtones of the incarnation in it as well. Here he is using a title to refer to his divinity, and he has some, uh, some sublines in the symphony playing which refer to his humanity and the great mission that he's on. Well, let's take a um, let's take a quick break, okay. and then we'll come back. Good. All right. Yeah, take about five minutes. Get some more coffee and donuts, and come on back. Where are we going from here? This humanity. Yes, we're going to go to his humanity. I'm going to skip a whole set of uh, earthly. Son of Man says, and we'll go straight to his man. All right. Five minutes to get ready for the information. 